Amen. Thank you, Liz. Another fine job with these names in Nehemiah. If you're new with us, we're going through the, the book of Nehemiah. We um, plan, Lord willing, to finish it up uh, by the uh, end of November, and then we'll be uh, in a series on Advent starting December 3rd, and then, Lord willing, in January, January 7th, we'll start the book of James. Uh, much easier book to read, uh, but a difficult one to apply. Uh, we will likely be at three services as well uh, during uh, the new year at some point. So um, a lot of exciting things happening, a lot to pray for. And if you come in this room t- today and you are particularly tired, um, you feel distant from God, um, you're weary because of uh, your own sin and rebellion, I pray that you would allow this text to wash over you and minister to your soul. It's a prayer of repentance. And um, it is the kindness of God that leads us to repentance. And this particular text teaches us what it looks like to repent. And it's a great gift to us in doing that. And so let's pray together and ask for the Lord to meet with us in his word here. Father, we bless you. Thank you for your word. What a gift to hear from you. What What a gift to have the Bible in our language. We pray we would not take these blessings for granted but we would be mindful of all that you've done for us, for your abundant goodness to us. And we pray today as we see this text that you would show us yourself, you would show us our sin, and you would show us our Savior. And in seeing him, we would walk in new patterns of obedience. And we pray this in Jesus' good name. Amen. I don't know if you've ever uh, stepped into a teenager's bedroom and uh, asked yourself, how on earth is this possible? all of these clothes or all of this garbage, how on earth did you accumulate all of this? Or maybe you've stepped into a, a group of college guys for their, their house and you've noticed the accumulation of dishes and ask yourself the same thing. Accumulation can be a surprising thing and uh, often a sad thing. But have you ever stopped to consider the accumulation of your sins? How on earth can you possibly deal with that? Well, we're thankful this morning that there is more mercy in Christ than sin in us. We're thankful that Psalm 130 is true, that if God kept a record of sins, nobody could stand. But with Him, there is forgiveness. What we're seeing in Nehemiah 9 is the accounting of Israel's sins, how they have rebelled against God and how God has responded to that rebellion in both righteousness and mercy. Last week, we, or two weeks ago rather, we looked at Nehemiah chapter 8, which was a great season of revival as the people reestablished the authority of Scripture in their lives. Here is a second mark of revival, and that is the acknowledgement of our sins, the coming, to, coming clean before God with those sins and turning from those sins, uh, an expression of repentance. These two things are always present in a revival. That is, reestablishing, reordering our lives according to the Scriptures and repenting of sin. Now, if you remember a few weeks ago uh, in Nehemiah chapter 8, that when the people heard the word, that they were immediately gripped by it and began to mourn and to weep, but they were told not to mourn and weep because it was a festival season. It was the Feast of Trumpets, it was the Feast of Tabernacles, it was the Day of Atonement, it was a season of grace, so they were told to rejoice. And now, three and a half weeks later, you see in chapter 9, verse 1, 24th day of the month, three and a half weeks later now, they're doing, they're they're, they're completing this process of mourning. They have unfinished business with God. Not because a calendar dictates it, but because they had met God in His Word, and God had exposed their sin and their folly and their rebellion. And what we have now is the recounting of Israel's history and their turning from that sin in repentance. Now, I want you to see where all of this is going because it's a long chapter. It's a long prayer. You might find this interesting. I find this interesting. This is the fullest summary of the Old Testament in the Old Testament. So if you don't have a clue about the Old Testament, Nehemiah 9 is your chapter. It goes from creation to Nehemiah 9, to their situation, which is at the end of the history of Israel. So we move from creation to Abraham, to the Exodus, to the conquest, to the judges, to the kings, to the exile, to the present time. They're recounting how God has responded to the rebellion, and where it all ends is verse 38. We are in great distress. So the question I put before you this morning, based on Nehemiah chapter 9, 
is where do you go in great distress, in sin, in seasons of rebellion? Is there any hope for you? And Nehemiah 9 will show you that there is. There is hope in the gospel. This is the, this is the big idea I want you to see. In seasons of sin and distress, you can experience God's restoring mercy as you prayerfully and repentantly reflect on the storyline of Scripture. The Bible is given to us not just for our information, but transformation. They're praying the Bible. That's a good pattern. They're praying it repentantly. They're praying the storyline of the Bible. And so for us as New Covenant believers, we want to follow this pattern, but we have to add a few paragraphs, don't we? We know more than they knew, and we have more resources than they had. We know that one is coming soon at the end of Nehemiah who will deal with our sin fully and finally. Atonement will be made, a full atonement. We know that in Jesus, we will have the Holy Spirit indwelling us, giving us power to fight sin. And we know the assurance of the Father's love based upon the Son's work in the cross and that no wrath remains on God's children. And we are assured, as we continue to read the storyline of the Bible to the end of Revelation, that there will be a time in which you and I never sin again. The Bible is a great gift to us in restoring us. As we prayerfully and reflect, reflectively, repentantly read the storyline of the Scriptures, God restores us mercifully. And so it's a great chapter for us to think about what does it look like to repent it's a great chapter if you're ever counseling someone who's embedded in sin. You've often found, found yourself, if you've discipled anyone like this, asking the question, is this repentance real? Is this brokenness real? Is there real change? Because repentance always involves real change. And it's a great book for our own souls. And so let's have a look at it. I'm going to study it in three parts this morning. First of all, you see in verses 1 to 5 that the people are pursuing God in heartfelt confession and repentance. Verse 1, now on the 24th day of the month, the people of Israel were assembled with fasting and in sackcloth and with earth on their heads. All of these physical displays demonstrated a heart of repentance. It was passionate. They, they came to meet with God. This was not a, just a, a ritual. This was not perfunctory. This was serious business. They had unfinished business to do with God, and so they came with, with fasting which was an obvious physical challenge, sackcloth, that is camel hair, very irritable, and with dirt on their head as a sign of the whole body, inside, outside, all of them, they're coming together in total repentance before God. What you see from this is not so much that you and I need to put dirt on our head and wear sackcloth, but that confession is serious. Confession and repentance is not something we do at a confession booth. We confess our sins to God because we've sinned ultimately against God. And if we don't take confession and repentance seriously, it shows that we haven't taken God seriously. It shows we haven't taken our own sin seriously. And so we follow these Israelites in their pursuit of God that is very passionate, being mindful of what Jesus said, blessed are the, those who mourn for they will, they will receive comfort. Without the mourning, without the brokenness, without the coming before God with all you have, there'll be no comfort, no restoration. And so we see a whole list of them in verse 2. The Israelites separated themselves from all foreigners, that is, from those who weren't pure Jews, because again, they're going to confess the sins of their fathers. And they stood and confessed their sins and the iniquities of their fathers. And they stood up in their place and read from the book of the law, the Lord their God, for a quarter of the day. So for three hours they're reading the Bible. And another three hours, it says in the next phrase here, they're making confession and worshiping. So there's both confession and adoration taking place in this experience of revival, in this experience of worship. And then we read of two groups of Levites. The first group there, Jeshua and Bani and Kadmael and Shebaniah and Bunny, poor guy. Uh, <laughs> don't ever name your kid Bunny. Um, uh, Sherebiah, Bani, Chaniah, they all cried with a loud voice to the Lord their God. So again, notice this, this passion. And they know who they're praying to. Notice the end of verse 5. They say, stand up and bless the Lord your God from everlasting to everlasting. Blessed be your glorious name, which is exalted above all blessing and all praise. 
Now, notice something very obvious. They know who they're praying to. Who you pray to matters. We live in a very superstitious, pluralistic culture that says it doesn't matter who you pray to, just pray. (laughs) Well, you don't want to dial the wrong number. There's a true and living God that you pray to. And so their affections from the very beginning is directed Godward. They know who they're approaching. The God who has been revealed in the Bible. We believe in the God of biblical revelation, not human speculation or our wild imagination. God has revealed himself in the pages of Scripture. And we approach that God in prayer. And that then drives their prayer as they move into this experience of adoration and worship and then into confession. So as you read this, it's just remarkable at how biblical this prayer is, how true they, they, they are in recounting the story of Scripture. I just wonder what people would learn about God from hearing you pray. We're overhearing their prayer, what they believe about God. They're teaching theology in their prayer. And that's a great challenge to us. What would people learn about God from your prayers? Well, we see here then in verse 6, this whole narrative now from verse 6 to verse 31, who their God is. And as they pray in view of the story of Scripture, they, they pray in light of Scripture, understanding who God is, understanding who they are. And about 85 times you find this personal pronoun, you or your or yours, directed to God. He's the main subject of this prayer. Again, their prayer is radically God-centered, and their prayer highlights the goodness of God in all that He had done for Israel, and then the mercy of God in light of how He responded to the rebellion. And it's just staggering as you consider these expressions of his goodness and his mercy. Notice verse 6. They begin with creation. You are the Lord, you alone. You have made the heaven, the heaven of heavens, all their hosts, the earth, and all that is on it. That's very important in the Genesis account. The writer of Genesis is going to great pains to show us that there's one God over all. There's not a God over the sea, a God over the a sky, a God over the heavens, a God over the sun. There is one God. You and you alone are the true and living God. You made all of it. And everybody is created to worship this God. So prayer is not manipulating God to get what we want. It begins with this spirit of worship. Verse 6 carries the tone of the whole prayer. It's an, it's an expression of adoration. Jesus told us to pray just like that, did he not? When he says, when you pray, pray like this. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Make your name great. Prayer begins first and foremost with adoration and the greatness of God and who he is. And if we can align ourselves with that, then we can learn how to, how to pray in a, uh, with, with the spirit of worship. So we're not manipulating God. And Jesus even tells us in one place, hey, when you pray, remember this. The Father knows what you need before you ask. And have you ever read that and thought, oh, what on earth am I asking for stuff? If you already know. And the moment you begin to ponder that, the moment you begin to learn something very important about prayer. The prayer is not fundamentally about getting something, but being with someone. It's about being with God. You and you alone are God. You get to be with God. God wants to talk to you. Think about that. Some people don't want to talk to you. But God does. The one who made everything, the heaven of heavens, the sea and all that is in them. So again, there is adoration here. There's awe here. It begins to talk about the the, uh, creation, making all that is in them. This is a great time of the year, isn't it, to enjoy creation. What a beautiful place we get to live in. With all the leaves turning colors. We see his glory. And Romans 1 tells us that we are created to worship this creator. But many people turn it inward and they worship creation instead of creator. And so let the manifold expressions of God's goodness in creation call you to worship in this autumn season. And I pray that word autumn can make a comeback. In autumn, not fall, autumn, as we see the spectacular colors that it leads you to worship. And when you see God at work in very small ways in creation, like for example, kids, when you think about this, when you lose a tooth, what happens? 
it grows back. Another one grows back. That's amazing. Isn't that amazing? Unless you lose your permanent teeth. Like, <laughs> one of mine has had that happen. It's really hard to bob for apples when you lose those. But, but what I'm saying is, in all these manifold ways we see works of creation, let them be a call to praise. When that tooth grows back, kids, that should, that should be your reminder. God did that. God made me. God's called me to himself. When you see those matchless colors, let it be cause for praise. As Calvin said, there's not one color in all the universe, not one blade of grass that is not intended to make you rejoice. It's intended to make you rejoice. That's what creation should do for us. And then he moves to God's grace in choosing Abraham. We see the gospel here in verse 7 in the beginning of it. Some 2,000 uh, years as they are recounting this. You are the Lord, the God who chose Abraham and brought him out of the Ur of the Chaldeans. So we're in Genesis 12 here. So we moved up to, to chapter 12. Um, it's going to be a while today, guys. I've got to get through the whole Old Testament with you. Um, and he gave him the name Abraham. This is Genesis um, 17. Gave him a new name. And then he flips back to Genesis 15 in verse 8. You found his heart to be faithful before you. Right? He believed God and he was credited to him as righteousness. So he goes Genesis 12, Genesis 17, Genesis 15. It's not in chronological order. It's in theological order. It's gospel. Chosen, new identity, walk in faithfulness. God's grace to Abraham. Again, the goodness of God will be on display in various ways. Verse 8, you found his heart to be faithful before you, and you made, him, made with him a covenant to give to his offspring the land of all the ites. And you kept your promise, for you are righteous. Now, this is also very important. The righteousness of God undergirds all of this. You kept your promise because you're righteous. What does it mean to, to be righteous? It depends on who you ask. I was talking to Shane Shaddix recently about uh, the joy we've had over the years of teaching inner city kids who uh, don't have all the inhibitions that most church people have, who talk back to you and say whatever's on their mind. Um, we experienced a lot of this, Kimberly and I, when I was in New Orleans. But Shane was teaching one time and he asked the kids, so what is, what is righteous? What does it mean to be righteous? And little kids said, girls are righteous. Well, I think we could go a little deeper than that as we think about righteousness. What does it mean to be righteous? Well, it means essentially to do what is right. And God always does what is right. He always does that which is just. Every single act he has ever done has been righteous. Perfectly just. And this undergirds the whole history of Israel. Now, I want you to keep that in mind because later I want us to consider how we reconcile God's mercy and God's righteousness. But for now, verse 9. We move into the Exodus and the wilderness wandering here. And you saw the affliction of our fathers in Egypt and heard their cry at the Red Sea. So this is um, Gen uh, Exodus 2, as the people are being crushed by Pharaoh. He heard their cry. He performed signs and wonders against Pharaoh. That's all the plagues, the frogs, the the blood, the gnats, and so on, and all the servants and all the people of the land. For you knew that they had acted arrogantly against our fathers, and you made a name for yourself, as it is to this day. And you divided the sea before them, so that they went through the midst of the sea on dry land, and you cast their pursuers into the depths as a stone into mighty waters. By a pillar of cloud you led them in the day, and by a pillar of fire you led them at night, by a light for them to light the way in which they should go. You came down from Mount Sinai and spoke with them from heaven and gave them right rules and true laws and good statutes and commandments. And you made known to them your holy Sabbath. Notice all the goodness of God. The Sabbath was a gift. The law was a gift. Guiding by fire at night, the cloud by day, a gift. Verse 15, you gave them bread from heaven for their hunger. You brought water from out of the rock for their thirst. You told them to go in and possess the land that you had to give them. Now, why is all of this important? Why are they recounting all these things? Because remember, they're, they're in present distress. And what they're doing is recounting the mercy of God because they're going to ask God to have mercy again upon them. This is how good you've been. This is how merciful you've been. Verse 16 then begins this transition, which is really the heart of the appeal of this prayer. We move from the exodus to exile. And what you see is this, six cycles of rebellion and mercy. 
Six cycles of this is what you did in your goodness, but we rebelled, but you were merciful. We rebelled, you were merciful. That's the rhythm from verse 16 down to verse 31. And again, the reason they're recounting this is because they're in a period of rebellion and distress, and they want God to act in mercy again. So they're basing their prayer in the mercy of God and what he has done in redemptive history. So verse 16 to 17 is this first cycle. You were this good to them, but, notice verse 16, they and our fathers acted presumptuously and stiffened their neck and did not obey your commandments. The same language is used for the, go- for the calf with a stiff neck. They became like that which they worshipped, which is what Psalm 115 tells us happens. We become like that which we worship. They refused to obey and were not mindful of the wonders that you performed among them. So they forgot all that you had done for them. But they stiffened their neck and appointed a leader to return to their slavery in Egypt. That is, they appointed Aaron because they want to go back to Egypt. God frees them from Pharaoh, takes them through the Red Sea, gives them crispy cream from heaven, water from a rock, guides them with a, a pillar by a fire at, at night and a cloud by day. And what do they do? Where's a calf? And they say, we want to go back to Egypt. This is a picture of sin. It, a lot of people believe wrongly, sadly, that sin will lead you to freedom. Sin is bondage. Sin leads you to slavery. Sin, according to the Bible, is stupid. It's like worshiping a calf, a golden calf. After the God who brought you through the Red Sea is there worthy of worship. What do they want to do? They want to go back to Egypt. And apart from the grace of God, that's what we do. We now have the power of the Spirit to fight sin. But in this rebellion, what was God's response? Notice the next phrase. But you are a God ready to forgive. That's one of the most hopeful phrases in the Bible. Our God is ready to forgive. God is more ready to forgive than you are to repent. Listen, if you won't repent, come to Jesus. It's not because he won't have you. He's ready to forgive. It's because you won't come. He says this in the New Testament. Come to me, all who are weary, tired. I'll give you rest. He is a God ready to forgive, who is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love, and did not forsake them. This is Exodus 34. Moses, after the golden calf, says, God, show me your glory, and God reveals his name to them. And he says, I am the God who is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love. Well, that's rebellion number one and mercy number one. Here's the second cycle in verse uh, 18. Even when they had made for themselves a golden calf and said, this is your God who brought you up out of Egypt and had committed great blasphemies. Here's the response of mercy. You in your great mercies did not forsake them in the wilderness. He didn't do away with them. He kept his promise. And verse 19 to verse 25 show how God was good in taking them all the way into the land. Despite this rebellion, despite the blasphemy, it says the pillar of cloud continued to lead them in the way and did not depart from them by day, nor the pillar of fire by night to light for them the way by which they should go. You gave your good spirit, probably a reference to those 70 elders being given the spirit to help Moses govern to instruct them and to not withhold your manna from their mouth. And you gave them water for their thirst. Forty years you sustained them in the wilderness and they lacked nothing. They appreciated nothing but lacked nothing. Again, remarkable grace. Their clothes did not wear out. And this is the one that gets me. Their feet did not swell. You walk around for 40, 40 years in rocks, and in that environment, and you got no swelling in your feet. How many of you old guys and middle-aged guys like me know that if you go play basketball all day, your feet going to hurt the next day? I'm not getting out of the bed, most likely. Forty years, God's preserving them. God's sustaining them. Bread from heaven, water from rock, sandals not wearing out. It goes on, verse 22 is the conquest, Joshua going into the land. And you gave them kingdoms of people that allotted for them every corner. So they took the possession of the land of Sion, king of Heshbon, and the land of Og, king of Bashan. You multiplied their children as the stars of heaven, and you brought them into the land that you had told their fathers to enter and possess. 
Now notice all the goodness of God here. So the descendants went in and possessed the lands, and you subdued before them the inhabitants of the land, the Canaanites, and gave them into their hand with their kings and the peoples of the land, that they might do with them as they would. And they captured fortified cities and a rich land, and took possession of houses full of all good things, cisterns already hewn, vineyards, olive orchards, and fruit trees in abundance. So they ate and were filled and became fat and delighted themselves in, and this is the summary of it, your goodness. God was good. God was good. Food, houses, provision. What happens in response? Notice verse 26, the first word. Nevertheless. What a picture of sin. My friends, God has been good to us. You consider the grace of God in your life when it comes to family, a home, food, job, friends. And what sin is, is basically saying to God, I don't care. I just want my sin. That's what's going on here. I don't care that you've been good to me. I just want my sin. That's the sinfulness of sin. The lack of gratitude to the goodness of God feeling entitled to the goodness of God. They go their way in this next cycle, verse 26. It says they were disobedient, rebelled against you, and cast their law behind their back. What a picture of rebellion. They take God's word and they put it behind their back. Instead of being before it, they ignore it. My friends, God has been good to us in this land in so many ways. And I don't have time to go on about it, but I'll just give you one example of God's goodness to us. And that is in giving us so much literature in the English language. We have more biblical theological resources in English than any other language in the world, probably as much as the top 10 languages next to to English in the world. You consider all the education, you consider all the freedoms, God has been good. The question is, what do we do with this goodness? Do we take that which he's given us and put it behind our back? Do we say, we don't care that you've been good to us. We want our sin. Well, sadly, that's what happens to many. And here we see again, God continued to pursue them. What grace. Notice he says, they killed the prophets. God sent prophets to turn them back. And they ignored them. Verse 27, therefore you gave them into the hand of their enemies who made them suffer. And in the time of their suffering, they cried out to you. And again, hear God's grace. You heard from heaven. And according to your great mercies, you gave them saviors, that is the judges, who saved them from the hand of their enemies. So again, rebellion, mercy. 28, more rebellion. But after they had rest, they did evil again before you. And you abandoned them to the hand of their enemies so that they had dominion over them. That, this time God is exercising discipline. Yet when they turned and cried to you, here comes the mercy, you heard from heaven and many times you delivered them according to your mercies. Cycle number five, verse 29. And you warned them in order to turn them back to your law. Yet they acted presumptuously and did not obey your commandments, but sinned against your rules, which if a person does them, he shall live by them. And they turned a stubborn shoulder and stiffened their neck and would not obey. Mercy coming up. Many years you bore with them. Now we're in the kings. And warned them by your spirit through the prophets. Yet they would not give ear. Therefore you gave them into the hand of the peoples of the lands. Exile. We went from creation to exile. We went six cycles of rebellion, mercy, rebellion, mercy. Final act of mercy, verse 31. Nevertheless, in your great mercies, you did not make an end of them, nor forsake them, for you are a gracious and merciful God, and we should praise God that he is. When we're told in the New Testament, be merciful, for your Father in heaven is merciful, we ought to have a look at Nehemiah 9 to see how merciful he's been to get a sense of the gravity and depth of his mercy. They use all of that history, all right? So we're from Abraham to the present time, where they're at, about 400 B.C. 
And now they're going to make their plea. That's the third part here of the text. They use this to plead to God for their present restoration. Verse 32. Now, therefore, our God, the great, the mighty, the awesome God. This sounds a lot like Nehemiah 1 in his prayer, doesn't it? Who keeps covenant and steadfast love. Let not all this hardship seem little to you that has come upon us, upon our kings, our princes, our priests, our prophets, our fathers, and all your people since the time of the kings of Assyria until this day. You have been righteous in all that has come upon us, for you have dealt faithfully and we have acted wickedly. They take total ownership. There's no spin game here, no blame shifting. Verse 34, our kings, our princes, our priests, and our fathers have not kept your law or paid attention to your commandment and your warning that you gave them, even in their own kingdom and amid your great goodness. There's goodness everywhere in the Old Testament that you gave them. And in the large and rich land that you set before them, they did not serve you or turn from their wicked works. Behold, we are slaves this day in the land that you gave our fathers to enjoy its fruit and its good gifts. Behold, we are slaves, and its rich yield goes to the kings whom you have set over us because of our sins. They rule over our bodies and over our livestock as they please, and we are in great distress. What are they appealing to? They're appealing to God to be merciful again. They're prepared to make a covenant, verse 38. We'll look at that covenant next week. Because all this, we make a firm covenant in writing on the sealed document, the names of our princes, our Levites, and our priests. Well, what do we say about this really long section in Nehemiah? Well, I'm glad you asked. Should we just pray Nehemiah chapter 9? My answer is yes and no. Nehemiah 9 is giving us a great pattern of praying the Bible. But we have to add a few chapters to Nehemiah. Because the canon continues to unfold. The story of Scripture continues to unfold, doesn't it? And as we look at the whole of the Bible now, and we we read the whole of the Bible to pray repentantly, we see how God can be both righteous and merciful at the same time. How He can be both just and gracious. And if you're with us in our study of Romans, you know where I'm going with this. Because if you you read Nehemiah 9, and all you're going to do is stop with Nehemiah 9, this this is what you've got you're going to repeat the cycle too. But in Jesus Christ, the cycle is broken. In Jesus Christ, God makes a way to punish sin and also at the same time demonstrate mercy. Notice what Paul says in Romans chapter 3, verse 21 to 26, what some have called the heart of the Bible. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Watch verse 25. Whom God put forward as a propitiation by His blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness. The cross was a display of God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over former sins. That's Nehemiah chapter nine. Oh, he was patient. Oh, he was merciful. But when we get to the end of the Old Testament, we're like, well, will his mercy run out? Do we just cross our fingers and hope God is merciful to us? Or will he vindicate his righteousness in punishing us? Well, in the New Testament, we've got hope. Because in the cross, Jesus took our punishment. God vindicated his righteousness by punishing his son. And God dispensed mercy to all who believe in him. You see, my friends, God will punish sin. Either in a place called hell or Jesus took your punishment. But God will vindicate his righteousness. And so what we do as Christians is we flee to the son. Kiss the son, the psalmist says, lest he be angry and you perish in the way. Oh, we have a way in which God is both merciful and righteous. It's in the cross. So what does that mean? It means when we look at the Bible, we read it with an eye toward Calvary, don't we? We can find mercy and restoration because the gospel is true. And because Jesus Christ made full atonement and final atonement, we have new resources now as Christians to fight sin, don't we? Ezekiel 36 tells us that in the new covenant, God will put his spirit within us. 
Not an external law driving us, but an internal spirit pushing us to obedience. And the Holy Spirit is a down payment for the new heavens and new earth which is to come, right? He has sealed us for the day of redemption. And what that means is there will be a day in which we will never sin again. We read the Bible, Old Testament, and it is pointing us to the Savior who puts an end of our sin, who takes our place in punishment. And we continue to read to Revelation, and we read of a place in which there is no more sin and no more shame. All of it made possible in the Savior. And that's why what God is doing with these people is so important. He's preserving them in His faithfulness, in His promise. He's bringing forth Messiah so that you and I don't have to die in our sins. And now as Christians, we don't have to fight sin with a defeatist mindset. We fight as victors and not victims. So yes, we read Nehemiah chapter 9, but we don't stop with Nehemiah 9, do we? So let me summarize it like this. Five takeaways from Nehemiah chapter 9 in regard to prayer. Briefly, first of all, Nehemiah 9 teaches us to pray passionately. I draw this from uh, the very beginning of this prayer, but also from the length of this prayer. There should be my time, friend, uh, times, my friends, that when you pray, you can pray for a long season. Unhu- unhurried, unhindered prayer. You could read scripture for a long, long time. The Puritans used to say, pray until you've prayed. This is a long prayer. Well, they got a lot to deal with. And so we don't want to relegate all of our prayer to multitasking. You know, the Bible says pray without ceasing, so we don't, never, we, we don't really need to spend a lot of unhurried time in prayer. No, don't do that. Get in the closet. Get with your Father. Pray passionately. Secondly, we see in this text the need to obviously pray biblically. They know who they're talking to. They know God's character. They know God's mercy. Some of you wonder, how could I pray for a long time? I don't know how to do that. Well, if you've got the Bible, you've got a lot to pray for, don't you? Read, pray, read, pray, read, pray. You find all sorts of stuff you should be praying for. Thirdly, we see from their prayer the need to pray honestly. For prayer to be life-changing, you have to be honest. This is a very honest prayer. I mean, think about if you took the statements from Nehemiah 9 about what the people said about themselves and their sin, you put those statements on a job application. Would anybody hire you? Oh, what do you what, tell us about what your character is like. Well, I'm stiff-necked, rebellious, idolatrous. Um, I don't care about God's goodness, and uh, I'll just do whatever the heck I want to do. And I, I like to go back to slavery. Want to hire me? I mean, it's crazy. Like, we don't want to talk about sin. You know why? We're sinners. That's why we don't want to talk about it. We want to blame shift. We want to hide it. We want to explain it away. We want to redefine it. Or just somehow manage it. But we don't want to admit it. Next time some of you singles are on those dating sites, you should put some of these descriptions down. Want to go out with me? I'm stiff-necked and rebellious, idolatrous. Want to go on a date? No, it's laughable to think about talking like this. But the Bible is a mirror. It's exposing who we are, isn't it? It's honest. And the Bible makes us honest in prayer. Fourthly, leading from that, pray repentantly. We don't just admit our sin, but we want to pray repentantly. What is repentance? Repentance, Romans 6, is putting sin to death and walking in new patterns of obedience. Repentance involves change, a change of lifestyle, change of patterns. That's real repentance. There's fruit in repentance. Not perfection, but progression. Fruit. So we pray repentantly, asking God to help us to change. There are four false versions of repentance, I just want to note quickly, that we must always avoid in prayer. One is self-righteousness. Many people don't repent of sin because they only see other people's sin, not their own sin. Listen, I should hate my sin more than your sin when you sin differently than I sin. That's what self-righteousness is. Self-righteousness is the ability to detect everybody's sin except your own. You're like a sniper, just continue to pull them out. That kind of heart will never be transformed. That is Luke 18, the Pharisee praying. I'm glad I'm not like that guy. We must crush self-righteousness. We must first look at our own, you know, log in our eye 
before we deal with others. We must also avoid just mere confession. This is very common where people will admit, yeah, I did wrong. Well, so do serial killers. Like confessing that you did something wrong is not repentance. It's important. You must own it, but it's not repentance because you can confess something and have no desire for change. Third, worldly sorrow. Steve talked about it last week with beautiful British English. Worldly sorrow is when you cry a whole lot, but you have no desire for change. It can be very manipulative. You can play the victim and not really be changed. Worldly sorrow. Or there's this other form of false repentance Tim Keller calls religious repentance, which is wanting to change, but wanting to change for the wrong reasons. Wanting to be elevated, perhaps wanting something you lost, where repentance has the right motivation, which is Jesus, His glory, the name of God's Son, the honor of God's reputation. So look at that list. Which are you more prone to practice? What the people in Nehemiah are doing is seeking to practice real repentance, putting sin to death, and walking a new way. And you know how I know that is because I've read chapter 10 and 11, and they make some serious commitments to walking in new patterns of behavior. Finally, we pray hopefully. <clears throat> the way you deal with all those f- false forms of repentance is Jesus. We can pray with hope this morning because full atonement has been made. No wrath remains on God's children. Therefore, you are welcomed into the Father's presence. You can pray with the assurance of the Father's love. You can pray with the certainty of a new heaven and new earth. We pray with hope as Christians. We repent out of a love for Jesus, who says, if you confess your sin, he is faithful and just to forgive your sin and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. So my friends, the good news of the gospel is that your failure has not put you beyond the reach of Jesus' restoring grace. Will you repent? And repentance is a gift. It's a great gift from God. Luther put it well, didn't he, when he says we experience God's, God's grace in one of three ways, once for all, again and again, and more and more. And if you're not a Christian, what we do is we call you to Christ Jesus. The one who, who put an end of our, our fear of condemnation. Experience his grace once and for all and become new. Or as a Christian, you may need to experience his grace again and again. We all do. Restored fellowship with the Father. As we read the Bible, we pray the Bible, we repent in light of the Bible. We experience his grace again and again and more and more. So even now, as we prepare our hearts for the Lord's Supper... Let's get ourselves in a posture of confession and repentance. Ask for the Lord to renew our affections for the Savior, that we would repent out of love for Jesus, and that he would restore us. Let's pray together. Father, we love you. We thank you for your word. Pray you would keep us from self-righteousness, keep us from merely confessing things, keep us from a worldly sorrow, keep us from religious repentance. Make us a people who practice repentance regularly, who are daily putting sin to death and walking in new patterns of obedience. We thank you for your word that illuminates your truth to us and leads us in the ways that please you. We pray that you would make us a people at IDC who are not just informed, but are transformed by your word as we read it, as we meet with you in prayer. Even now, as we prepare for the table, I pray that you would work your grace in our lives. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.